Chapter 6. The Role of Profits and Losses Rockefeller got rich selling oil. He found cheaper ways to get oil from the ground to the gas pump. John Stossel To those who run businesses, profits are obviously desirable and losses deplorable, but economics is not business administration. From the standpoint of the economy as a whole, and from the standpoint of the central concern of economics, the allocation of scarce resources, which have alternative uses, profits and losses play equally important roles in maintaining and advancing the standards of living of the population as a whole. Parts of the efficiency of a price-coordinated economy comes from the fact that goods can simply follow the money, without the producers really knowing just why people are buying one thing here and something else there, and yet another thing during a different season. However, it is necessary for those who run businesses to keep track not only of the money coming in from customers, it is equally necessary to keep track of how much money is going out to those who supply raw materials, labor, electricity, and other inputs. Keeping careful track of those numerous flows of money in and out can make the difference between profit and loss. Therefore, electricity, machines, or cement cannot be used in the same careless way that caused far more of such inputs to be used per unit of output in the Soviet economy than in the German or Japanese economy. From the standpoint of the economy as a whole and the well-being of the consuming public, the threat of losses is just as important as the prospect of profits. When one business enterprise in a market economy finds ways to lower its costs, Competing enterprises have no choice but to scramble and try to do the same. After the general merchandising chain Walmart began selling groceries in 1988, it moved up over the years to become the nation's largest grocery seller by the early 21st century. Its lower costs benefited not only its own customers, but those of other grocers as well. As the Wall Street Journal reported, when two Walmart supercenters at a rival regional grocery opened near a Kroger Co. supermarket in Houston last year, the Kroger's sales dropped 10%. Store manager Ben Bustos moved quickly to slash some prices and cut labor costs, for example, by buying ready-made cakes instead of baking them in-house, and ordering pre-cut salad bar items from suppliers. His employees used to stack displays by hand. Now, fruit and vegetables arrive stacked and gleaming for display. Such moves has hel have helped Mr. Bustos cut worker hours by 30 to 40 percent from when the store opened four years ago, and lower the prices of staples such as cereal, bread, milk, eggs, and disposable diapers. Earlier this year, sales at the Kroger finally edged up over the year before. In short, the economy operated more efficiently to the benefit of the consumers, not only because of Walmart's ability to cut its own costs and thereby lower prices, but also because this forced Kroger to find ways to do the same. This is a microcosm of what happens throughout a free market economy. When Walmart begins selling groceries in a community, a study showed, the average price of groceries in that community falls by 6 to 12%. Similar competition by low-cost sellers in other industries tends to produce similar results in those industries. It is no accident that people in such economies tend to have higher standards of living. Profits Profits may be the most misconceived subject in economics. Socialists have long regarded profits as simply overcharge, as Fabian socialist George Bernard Shaw called it, or a surplus value, as Karl Marx called it. Never talk to me about profit, India's first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, warned his country's leading industrialist. It is a dirty word. Philoso philosopher John Dewey demanded that production for profit be subordinated to production for use. From all these men's perspectives, profits were simply unnecessary charges added on to the inherent costs of producing goods and services, driving up the cost to consumers. One of the great appeals of socialism, especially back when it was simply an idealistic theory without any concrete examples in the real world, was that it sought to eliminate these supposedly unnecessary charges, making things generally more affordable, especially for people with lower incomes. 
Only after socialism went from being a theory to being an actual economic system in various countries around the world did the fact become painfully apparent that people in socialist countries had a harder time trying to afford things than, people in most, than most people in capitalist countries could afford with ease and took for granted. With profits eliminated, prices should have been lower in socialist countries, according to theory, and the standard of living of the masses correspondingly higher. Why, then, was it not that way in practice? Profits as incentives. Let us go back to square one. The hope for profits and the threat of losses is what forces a business owner in a capitalist economy to produce at the lowest cost and sell what the customers are most willing to pay for. In the absence of these pressures, those who manage enterprises under socialism have far less incentive to be as efficient as possible under given conditions, much less to keep up with changing conditions and respond to them quickly, as capitalist enterprises must do if they expect to survive. It was a Soviet premier, Leonid Brezhnev, who said that his country's enterprise managers shied away from innovation, as a devil shies away from incense. But given the incentives of government-owned and government-controlled enterprises, why should those managers have stuck their necks out by trying new methods or new products when they stood to gain little or nothing if innovation succeeded and might have lost their jobs, or worse, if it failed? Under Stalin, failure was often equated with sabotage and was punished accordingly. Even under the milder conditions of democratic socialism, as in India, for decades after its independence, innovation was by no means necessary for protected enterprises, such as automobile manufacturing. Until the freeing up of markets that began in India in 1991, the country's most popular car was the Hindustan Ambassador, an unabashed copy of the British Morris Oxford. Moreover, even in the 1990s, the economist referred to the ambassador as a barely upgraded version of a 1950s Morris Oxford. A London newspaper, The Independent, reported, Ambassadors have for years been notorious in India for their poor finish, heavy handling, and proneness to alarming accidents. Nevertheless, there was a waiting list for the ambassador, with waits lasting for months and sometimes years, since foreign cars were not allowed to be imported to compete with it. Under free market capitalism, the incentives work in the opposite direction. Even the most profitable business can lose its market if it doesn't keep innovating, in order to avoid being overtaken by its competitors. For example, IBM pioneered in creating computers, including one 1944 model occupying 3,000 cubic feet. But in, 1970s, sorry, but in the 1970s, Intel created a computer chip smaller than a fingernail that could do the same things as that computer. Yet Intel itself was then constantly forced to improve its chips at an exponential rate, as rivals like Advanced Micro Devices, AMD, Cyrix, and others began catching up with them technologically. More than once, Intel poured such huge sums of money into the development of, impro of improved chips as to risk the financial survival of the company itself. But the alternative was to, was to allow itself to be overtaken by rivals, which would have been an even bigger risk to Intel's survival. Although Intel continued as the leading seller of computer chips in the world, continuing competition from advanced micro devices spurred both companies to feverish innovation. The Economist reported in 2007, for a while, it seemed that AMD had pulled ahead of Intel in chip design. It devised a clever way to enable chips to handle data in both 32-bit and 64-bit chunks, which Intel reluctantly adopted in 2004. And in 2005, AMD launched a new processor that split the number crunching between two cores, the brains of a chip, thus boosting performance and reducing ener energy consumption but Intel came back strongly with its own dual-core design. Next year, it will launch new chips with eight cores on a single slice of silicon, at least a year ahead of AMD. Although this technological rivalry was very beneficial to computer users, it has had large and often painful economic consequences for both Intel and AMD. The latter had losses of more than a billion dollars in 2002, and its stocks lost four-fifths of their value. 
But four years later, the price of Intel stock fell by 20% in just three months, and Intel announced that it would lay off 1,000 managers, as its profits fell by 57%, while the profits of AMD rose by 53%. All this feverish competition took place in an industry where Intel sells more than 80% of all the computer chips in the world. In short, even among corporate giants, competition in innovation can become desperate in a free market, as the seesaw battle for market share in microchips indicates. The dean of the Yale School of Management described the computer chip industry as an industry in constant turmoil, and the chief executive officer of Intel wrote a book titled Only the Paranoid Survive. The fate of AMD and Intel is not the issue. The issue is how the consumers benefit from both technological advances and lower prices as a result of these companies' fierce competition to gain profits and avoid losses. Nor is this industry unique. In 2011, 45 of the Fortune 500 companies reported losses, totaling in the aggregate more than $50 billion. Such losses play a vital role in the economy, forcing corporate giants to change what they are doing under penalty of extinction, since no one can sustain losses of that magnitude indefinitely. Inertia may be a common tendency among human beings around the world, whether in business, government, or other walks of life. But businesses operating in a competitive market are forced by red ink on the bottom line to realize that they cannot keep drifting along like the Hindustan Motor Corporation, protected from competition by the Indian government. Even in India, the freeing of markets toward the end of the 20th century created competition in cars, forcing Hindustan Motors to invest in improvements, producing new ambassadors that were now much more reliable than their predecessors, according to The Independent newspaper, and now even had perceptible acceleration, according to The Economist magazine. Nevertheless, the Hindustan ambassador lost its long-standing position of the number one car in sales in India to a Japanese car manufactured in India, the Maruti. In 1997, 80% of the cars sold in India were Marutis. Moreover, in the now more competitive automobile market in India, Marutis too are improving in anticipation of the next invaders, according to The Economist. As General Motors, Volkswagen, and Toyota began investing in new factories in India, the market share of Maruti dropped to 38% by 2012. There was a similar pattern in India's wristwatch industry. In 1985, the worldwide production of electronic watches was more than double the production of mechanical watches. But in India, the HMT watch company produced the vast majority of the country's watches, and more than 90% of its watches were still mechanical. By 1989, more than four-fifths of the watches produced in the world were electronic, but in India, more than 90% of the watches produced by HMT were still the obsolete mechanical watches. However, after government restrictions on the economy were greatly reduced, electronic watches quickly became a majority of all watches produced in India by 1993 to 1994, and other watch companies displaced HMT, whose market share fell to 14%. While capitalism has a visible cost, profit, that does not exist under socialism, socialism has an invisible cost, inefficiency, that gets weeded out by losses and bankruptcy under capitalism. The fact that most goods are more widely affordable in a capitalist economy implies that profit is less costly than inefficiency. Put differently, profit is a price paid for efficiency. Clearly, the greater efficiency must outweigh the profit, or else socialism would, in fact, have had the more affordable prices and greater prosperity that its theorists expected but which failed to materialize in the real world. If, in fact, the cost of profits exceeded the value of the efficiency they promote, then non-profit organizations or government agencies could get the same work done cheaper or better than profit-making enterprises and could therefore displace them in the competition of the marketplace. Yet that seldom, if ever, happens, while the opposite happens increasingly. That is, private, profit-making companies taking over various functions formerly performed by government agencies or by non-profit organizations such as colleges and universities. Footnote. 
Further discussion of this phenomenon can be found in Chapter 24 in a section titled Nonprofit Organizations. End footnote. While capitalists have been conceived of as people who make profits, what a business owner really gets is legal ownership of whatever residual is left over after the costs of production have been paid out of the money received from customers. That residual can turn out to be positive, negative, or zero. Workers must be paid, and creditors must be paid, or else they can take legal action to seize the company's assets. Even before that happens, they can simply stop supplying their inputs when the company stops paying them. The only person whose payment is contingent on how well the business is doing is the owner of that business. This is what puts unrelenting pressure on the owner to monitor everything that is happening in the business and everything that is happening in the market for the business's products or services. In contrast to the layers of authorities monitoring the actions of those under them in a government-run enterprise, the business owner is essentially an unmonitored monitor as far as the economic efficiency of the business is concerned. Self-interest takes the place of external monitors and forces far closer attention to detail and far more expenditure of time and energy at work than any set of rules or authorities is likely to be able to do. That simple fact gives capitalism an enormous advantage. More important, it gives the people living in price-coordinated market economies visibly higher standards of living. It is not just ignorant people, but also highly educated and highly intellectual people like George Bernard Shaw, Karl Marx, Jawaharlal Nehru, and John Dewey, who have misconceived profits as arbitrary charges added on to the inherent costs of producing goods and services. To many people, even today, high profits are often attributed to high prices charged by those motivated by greed. In reality, most of the great fortunes in American history have resulted from someone's figuring out how to reduce costs so as to be able to charge lower prices and therefore gain a mass market for the product. Henry Ford did this with automobiles, Rockefeller with oil, Carnegie with steel, and Sears, Penny, Walton, and other department store chain founders with a variety of products. A supermarket chain in a capitalist economy can be very successful, charging prices that allow about a penny of clear profit on each dollar of sales. Because several cash registers are usually bringing in money simultaneously all day long in a big supermarket, those pennies can add up to a very substantial annual rate of return on the supermarket chain's investment, while adding very little to what the customer pays. If the entire contents of a store gets sold out in about two weeks, then that penny on a dollar becomes more like a quarter on the dollar over the course of a year, when that same dollar comes back to be reused 25 more times. Under socialism, that penny on each dollar would be eliminated, but so, too, would be all the economic pressures on the management to keep costs down. Instead of prices falling to 99 cents, they might well rise above a dollar after the enterprise managers lose the incentives and pressures to keep production costs down. Profit Rates When most people are asked how high they think the average rate of profit is, they usually suggest some number much higher than the actual rate of profit. Over the entire period of from 1960 through 2005, the average rate of return on corporate assets in the United States ranged from a high of 12.4% to a low of 4.1% before taxes. After taxes, the rate of profit ranged from a high of 7.8% to a low of 2.2%. However, it is not just the numerical rate of profit that most people misconceive. Many misconceive its whole role in a price-coordinated economy, which is to serve as incentives, and it plays that role wherever its fluctuations take it. Moreover, some people have no idea that there are vast differences between profits on sales and profits on investments. If a store buys widgets for $10 each and sells them for $15 each, some might say that it makes $5 in profits on each widget that it sells. But of course, the store has to pay the people who work there, the company that supplies electricity to the store, as well as other suppliers of other goods and services needed to keep the business running. What is left over after all these people have been paid is the net profit, usually a lot less than the gross profit. 
but that is still not the same as profit on investment. It is simply net profits on sales, which still ignores the costs of the investments which built the store in the first place. It is the profit on the whole investment that matters to the investor. When someone invests $10,000, what that person wants to know is what annual rate of return it will bring, whether it is invested in stores, real estate, or stocks and bonds. Profits on particular sales are not what matter most. It is the profit on the total capital that has been invested in the business that matters. That profit matters not just to those who receive it, but to the economy as a whole, because differences in profit rates in different sectors of the economy are what cause investments to flow into and out of these various sectors until profit rates are equalized, like water seeking its own level. Changing rates of profit allocate resources in a market economy when these are rates of profit on investment. Profit on sales are a different story. Things may be sold at prices that are much higher than what the seller paid for them. And yet, if those items sit on a shelf in the store for months without being sold, the profit on investment may be less than with other items that have less, th that have less of a markup in price, but which sell out within a week. A store that sells pianos undoubtedly makes a higher percentage profit on each sale than a supermarket makes selling bread. But a piano sits in the store for a much longer time waiting to be sold than a loaf of bread does. Bread would go stale and moldy waiting for as long, waiting for as, long as a piano to be sold. When a supermarket chain buys $10,000 worth of bread, it gets its money back much faster than when a piano dealer buys $10,000 worth of pianos. Therefore, the piano dealer must charge a higher percentage markup on the sale of each piano than a supermarket charges on each loaf of bread. If the piano dealer is to make the same annual percentage rate of return on a $10,000 investment. Competition among those seeking money from investors makes profit rates tend to equalize, even when that requires different markups to compensate for different turnover rates among different products. Piano stores can continue to exist only when their higher markups in prices compensate for slower turnover in sales. Otherwise, investors would put their money elsewhere and piano stores would start disappearing. When the supermarket gets its money back in a shorter period of time, it can turn right around and reinvest it, buying more bread or other grocery items. In the course of a year, the same money turns over many times in a supermarket, earning a profit each time, so that a penny of profit on the dollar can produce a total profit rate for the year on the initial investment equal to what a piano dealer makes charging a much higher percentage markup on an investment that turns over much more slowly. Even firms in the same business may have different turnover rates. For example, Walmart's inventory turns over more times per year than the inventory at Target stores. In the United States in 2008, an automobile spent an average of three months on a dealer's lot before being sold, compared to two months the previous year. However, in 2008, Volkswagens sold in about two months in the U.S., while Chrysler's took more than four months. Although supermarkets tend to have especially low rates of profit on sales because of their high rates of turnover, other businesses' profit, other businesses' profit rates on sales are also usually lower than what many people imagine. Companies that made the Fortune magazine list of the 500 largest companies in America averaged a return on revenues, sales, of a penny on the dollar in 2002, compared to six cents in 2000, the peak profit year. Profits on sales and profits on investment are not merely different concepts. They can move in opposite directions. One of the keys to the rise to dominance of the A&P grocery chain uh, one of the keys to the rise to dominance of the A&P grocery chain in the 1920s was a conscious decision by the company management to cut profit margins on sales in order to increase the profit rate on investment with the new and lower prices made possible by selling with lower profit per lower profits per item a and P was able to attract greatly increased numbers of customers, making far more total profit because of the increased volume of sales. 
making a profit of only a few cents on the dollar on sales, but with the inventory turning over nearly 30 times a year, A&P's profit rate on investment soared. This low price and high volume strategy set a pattern that spread to other grocery chains and to other kinds of enterprises as well. Consumers benefited from lower prices, while A&P benefited from higher profits on their investment, further evidence that economic transactions are not a zero-sum process. In a later era, huge supermarkets were able to shave the profit margin on sales still thinner because of even higher volumes of sales, enabling them to displace A&P from industry leadership by charging still lower prices. Conversely, a study of prices in low-income neighborhoods found that there were larger-than-usual markups in prices charged their customers, but at the same time, there were lower-than-usual rates of profit on investment. Higher profits on sales helped compensate for the higher costs of doing business in low-income neighborhoods, but apparently not completely, as indicated by the avoidance of such neighborhoods by many businesses, including supermarket chains. A limiting factor in how high stores in low-income neighborhoods can raise their prices to compensate for higher costs is the fact that many low-income residents already shop in stores in higher-income neighborhoods, where the prices are lower, even though this may entail paying bus fare or taxi fare. The higher the prices rise in low-income neighborhoods, the more people are likely to shop elsewhere. Thus, stores in such neighborhoods are limited in the extent to which they can offset higher costs and slower turnover with higher prices, often leaving them in a precarious financial position, even while they are being denounced for exploiting their customers with high prices. It should also be noted that, where there are higher costs of doing business in low-income neighborhoods, when there are higher rates of crime and vandalism, such additional costs can easily overwhelm the profit margin and make many businesses unsustainable in such neighborhoods. If a store clears a penny of profit on an item that costs a quarter, then if just one out of every 25 of these items gets stolen by shoplifters, that can make it unprofitable to sell in that neighborhood. The majority of people in the neighborhood may be honest consumers who pay for what they get at the store, but it takes only a fraction as many who are shoplifters, or robbers, or vandals to make it uneconomic for stores to locate there.